It's the appreciator again. This is our second appreciation. And this is a special one. Uh, I am now kind of an official interviewer for Ingo's Art Cafe and um, Mocktail Lounge in uh, Truth or Consequences. But when you drop by, uh, you'll visit Ingo and he'll take good care of you at his... Uh, facilities and uh, he has bands and performers play there and I am now to interview all of these artists as they pass through and uh, here is my uh, first try uh, this is a band called Midnight Express and uh, well check this out so uh, we're here at Ingo's with Midnight Express and you are Grace and you are Jacob, Jacob and Grace, and uh, we got some questions for you. Um, what was the first music that excited you as a kid? Man, well, this is a little embarrassing, but for me, it was musical theater. Mm-hmm. Oh, I, that works. And you? Uh, my elementary school band director. I knew he played the saxophone, but. Uh, once he played the Star Spangled Banner on the saxophone, but he tried to make it into jazz, and it was unrecognizable, and I loved it, and I, and I remember that, and I played the saxophone in school. Um, but he was willing, he was an elementary school band director in rural Kansas, and this was at a big assembly for the town, the whole town was there, and he was willing to improvise on our own Star Spangled Banner, like Jimi Hendrix. I mean... Now that's got to hand it to him. Where would you say you are from? Uh, I grew up in Maryland, not far from Baltimore. Baltimore. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you? Rural Kansas. How rural? Uh, town of 1,000. Nice. Town of 1,000. Moved to Florida when I was 12. But I don't talk about that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I tried it after high school. Everybody in my graduating class went there. Yeah. It was grim. <laughs> Still is. <laughs> when did you write your first song? Mm, I think I was maybe 11 or 12. Well, mm-hmm. Can you sing it? Well, it's, it's not to be shared, but I think it was called... Something, something with a broken bottle and a broken heart. Mm. Whoa. Yeah. Nice. Especially for 12. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you, your first song that you wrote? Um, Probably 17. And uh, I don't remember anything about it, but I remember my girlfriend at the time didn't like it. And that, yeah, that that, that'll crash your songwriting inspiration. It's a rough start. When the muse turns it down, yes. Who is your biggest inspiration? Uh, mm, I love Levon Helm a lot. I love how he's basically a Muppet. <laughs> and I really try to, like, channel Levon. Nice. Yeah. And your biggest inspiration? Well, I don't know. Inspiration is a funny word. I identify with Robert Crumb. Oh, a hero, definitely. A, a hero, a folk hero, but one who was willing to carry the torch for the nerds. Mm. Absolutely. One of the greats, and his music fits right in. You guys might pick up some of his cheap suit serenaders. I love them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What do you see as your trajectory? I think live music is a service, and I would like to be a service provider. Nice. <laughs> and you, are you in harmony? Anything to add to that? If you're not having fun, lower your standards. I like that. What act would you like to open for? Ooh. Willie Carlisle. Yeah, Willie our Carlisle. Bud, <laughs> our bud who got famous. Nice. <laughs> What's the next step on your tour, in case anybody's listening and might catch you? Well, we're playing next door at TRC Brewery And tomorrow. Um, yeah. From there, anything said, or you're just... Uh, well, it's kind of in the works, 
and like the the next like solid date that we have is in October yeah. in wow. Colorado, right? Mm-hmm. In in Pueblo. Mm-hmm. But it, this is our like um, kind of just like short notice. See what we can scrape together adventure right now because that's how you find new things. Yeah, and if you're floating around New Mexico. There are opportunities like this with almost no notice. You can almost walk into some cafes and say, we play. They'll go, oh, yeah, yeah. when? Yeah. <laughs> Our band is called Live Music Tonight. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Uh, what was the first live show you saw? Oh, live show was the Nutcracker. But live show that was music, well, I guess that was music. Well, the bands and right. performers. Ah, oh, I do remember. This was, it was a Ramones reunion tour. Nice. And Against All Authority opened up for them. Oh, wow. It was a punk show, and I was 14. Oh, yeah, I'm jealous. Well, I was, I was in my country phrase, broken bottle, broken heart. <laughs> I saw Kenny Chesney when I was about 12. But your, and your dad took you to the last waltz. No. He took me to one of Levon Helm's Midnight Rambles. Midnight Ramble. Yeah. Okay. So they were down a few members for sure by that time. Yeah, Rick Danko played a lot where I grew up before. Really? Yeah, he kind of faded the the last few gigs. Were... Yeah, they didn't they didn't do so good most of them. Yeah, Robbie Robertson kind of was the glue, and when he dumped them, it just. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, so what do you think of New Mexico? T or C? The vibe? The. I'm loving it here. We went to the hot springs. And yeah. Yeah. It's like a, a special place in the middle of the desert. We've been talking about what is how how does your perception of a place change over time? And how can you kind of parse what a place really is from your first impression of it? And then you know, like we just stayed somewhere for three years, and when we left, we thought it was a completely different place than when we got there. But of course, it was, it was the same place. Well, it, it, it's so. as as I've gotten older, nothing stands still. You just think it's going to. Really, it's you. You can't go back home, as uh, somebody famous once said, because sure. it's not home anymore. It's yeah. But you're the one that's changing, right? Or are you? Are you? No, it's everything thing? changes. I mean, they they knock down that and they build a mall and they just, yeah. Well, okay, that's undeniable. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And nothing. It's, it's every. And I think it's always been like that. I mean, there was the Dust Bowl and everybody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> rolled along. <laughs> Who's your favorite visual artist? Mm. If any. <laughs> that's a good question. Yeah. Ooh, I don't know who it is, but they do those those portraits of those mean little girls, but they have big heads. I love those. Yeah, I can't remember the name, but you know I, what I'm I know. About yeah, lots of olives and earth tones. Mm-hmm. Hmm. I'm just gonna say Egon Shield for fun because no one knows who that is. And now you're gonna have to check him out. If you're, if you're listening on the internet, it just takes a little two fingers and yeah, you, you can do spell it. it? Yeah. I, nobody can spell Shield, but his name his name is Egon Shield. He was a he was a self portrait artist, primarily. All right. Um, what's your dream venue? Okay, there is a whole bunch of people, super excited, but. No, I don't know. I was trying to go somewhere with that. Mm. There's a Dream potluck, venue. definitely. Potluck. Are we going intimate or like superstars? I think like... A, Just whatever whatever you would... Like a big party in the middle of the woods with a potluck and dancing. I went to this party in Oregon once mm-hmm. that was supposed to be a barter fair, like mm-hmm. a trading festival. And they had a concert, and then when the concert was supposed to be over, the band just kept playing for a long time, and then the next day, nobody left. And then it was just a big camping party. So, sweet. that was pretty sweet. I feel like that must have been what it was like to be a, a deadhead. Um, 
What? Who do you listen to now? Right now, listening to a lot of Neil Young, um, throwing the chicks in there, right. Cinda Williams. Yeah, we just got a Grateful Dead songbook from that guy who put it together, and I've I've been back and forth with the Dead. It's really popular to hate the Grateful Dead. Huh. I like the pig pen era best. There's just something really pure about back then. I don't know much about the eras. I know that I was I loved their album art. My my half sister had their albums when I was a kid. But I would put I put the album I put the music on and I didn't get it. I I think it's an acquired taste, but yeah. Like the song Box of Rain I have been listening to off and on for my entire adult life, and I think I just figured out what it meant this year. <laughs> they can be like that. I used to, the early albums I couldn't listen to when my cousins did when I was a kid, and then the last ten years I just oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. and uh, any just anything you always wanted to say and have somebody hear. <laughs> um. I'm filtering right now. <laughs> hey, well, that's even better. <laughs> I'm filtering. Uh, well, yeah, and so go on our band camp and listen to our lyrics. Nice. Yeah, your lyrics, <laughs> I have to say, I, I was really enjoying them. And I did one of your songs, It's Okay If I Stick That on YouTube or... Yeah, please, it, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Will do. And thanks so much for... Coming to TRC and letting me grill you. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah. I feel like I'm in the wrong chair. I'm very curious about you. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll ask go ahead. Question. <laughs> <laughs> well, where are you from? Originally the Catskills, upstate oh, New okay. York, 90 miles out of New York City. And that made it convenient once I was old enough to go in and out and see things when it was, when Times Square was still the total pit of. Keep shows right. and oh, it was oh. so fun and nasty. Cool. <laughs> and now it's like Disneyland. I know, yeah. yeah. And I haven't been back in years. I'm sure it's different again because again, that place has changed. Just every ten years, it's a new city. Yeah. Did you live there? Uh, for a while, I lived in Brooklyn uh-huh. uh, in Bensonhurst when it was still Italian, and the best pizza in the world was right there. I don't think any of it's all just regular shops like anywhere else now. And the, the mafia, the real mafia, ran the neighborhood that I lived in. And that doesn't exist anymore. They cleaned that up since the 80s. And then how long have you been in DRC? 16 years now. 16 years. And I'm almost a local. Because the people who've been here, they've been here, and like the farthest they've been is like Las Cruces is the big city, and mm-hmm. and they they're very happy with that, which is nice. Mm-hmm. It's like when I lived in Rhode Island. It's amazing, even people who lived in Providence, the biggest city, most of them had never gone more than five miles from the spot they were born. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, and that works. That works. I think it's the, the people who are really their life is about the family values, and just keeping that going. Then going on a trip is just something you would do with your family, anyways. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's good. Everything they need is right there. But since you know, Allen Ginsberg and the communists poisoned our minds. Yeah. yeah. We get to go wherever we want. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, I was. Well, my I, it's in my blood. My mother, it, she never come out here. She's got her little space on the corner of the couch mm. and her books, and that's and and now uh, since the kids left the nest, first it was one Yorkie, then it was two, and now it's oh. sets of three. They multiply. Oh yeah, and <laughs> that that's. She's, that's all she needs. The Yorkies. The Yorkies, her books, her spot on the couch, and she's good to go. Yep. Well, uh, 
if you if you were moving right now, would you move here again? Probably, although I'm really thinking of my friends visited from Wales. Oh. And I've never been, just being somewhere in Europe where, as uh, driving to Roswell, you could be in Berlin. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that just seems so appealing, and they speak all the languages. Uh-huh. And that's what's kept me really from going any, I, I would have gone to the UK, but... I think I, I I would feel disrespectful going somewhere and not being able to communicate. Oh yeah, you I feel don't, like an idiot. <laughs> yeah, and that too. It makes you feel like an idiot, but I don't think you should let that stop you now because everybody speaks English and but even you, Americans, we all speak English and you talk to somebody from a different part of the country, like sarcasm does not read. In many places in the well, country. That's true, yeah. oh, I need to remember that. Yeah, I'm from the Northeast. Oh, I was, tell me about it. <laughs> when I first got to New Mexico, local indigenous Hispanics and natives, it's alien to them. Huh. And you can really offend somebody very quickly. Oh, or no. My first landlord in Santa Fe, I said something and it was touch and go whether I was going to be instantly evicted. Wow. Yeah. And I was just. <laughs> I was, somebody was telling me in uh, Thailand, I think Thailand, where they lived for 10 years, that it took them a while to figure out that if you're sitting at a dinner table with a family that's from there, if they're being really polite to you, then it's because they don't want you there. And that the norm is to be like, hey, shithead, pass me the salt. Yep. And, and you need to learn to participate in that so that you can feel and yeah, they'll, they're comfortable and, and, not, and not alienate them by being like oh, could you please pass me the soul you know <laughs> but it's a little bit different everywhere mm-hmm. I guess yeah not just language itself can be tricky mm-hmm. oh, but especially now Europe I mean everyone is everyone's speaking people's grandmas are speaking English in Europe now yeah, no, that's become sort of the universal language because Esperanto didn't work. <laughs> right. right, yeah. Did Although Shatner know? speaks Esperanto, of oh, all people. Good. Does he? Like, he should. He, he, he did a movie. They, they made one major movie in Esperanto that nobody saw because nobody could understand it. Right? There's also that language that uh, Jim uh, Henson came up with. It's for the Dark Crystal. Oh, yeah. And then Tolkien came up with a bunch of languages. Yeah. But, and there's uh, Klingon that they've... The, some people, the real Trekkers, learn it. And yeah, I, I would I would do Esperanto. I'm not going to be the first one to do it, but I, if, like, four people that I knew learned it, I think I would get on board. Yeah. So. I, I, I tried Spanish, and once I hit the verb conjugations, <laughs> my brain just went... Yeah. Yeah, I've been there for a few years with Spanish. Go ahead and ask me anything. Wow. Well, okay, how old are you? 63. 63. So you were living in Brooklyn and when? 1983. Wow, okay. So that was a time to live in Brooklyn. Well, the, the, the one of the, but yeah. Yeah. That I now it just has no personality anymore, and then it was like my first night walking the sidewalk. This big Cadillac pulls up, and the window goes down. You belong in this neighborhood. (laughs) And if if I didn't, I might have been in trouble. Just they they watched the streets back then, and yeah, if you they would quietly suggest that maybe you should take your walk somewhere else. Did you? I, 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 I mentioned who I was staying with and who I knew and why I was there. And, oh, okay. okay. Now we'll know who you are. So were you, were you in, in 82, there's a lot of weird fashions going on. Were you into any of those? Or? Uh, well, was I was the into the new wave music, okay. uh, bands like Magazine, the Ramones. But they were a little before. They were my first like punk concert. Oh, I had a friend wow. in Albany that I used to go visit see bands, the Plasmatics when they were the Plasmatics and Wendy O. Williams was basically doing a live sex show and uh-huh. singing 
Right. So what were you wearing at that time? Going out a to bit a big jeans show. and a t. I was never a fashion guy. Timeless. I mean, yeah. I wasn't in my hometown. It just Monticello was just a little. It was only ninety miles from New York City, but walking around like that might have uh, completely. See, we had to ask what you were wearing to know like how intense the mob was. Because if you were wearing a black suit and a fedora, it'd be like, of course, the mom wanted to know what you were up to. But I was just wearing a <laughs> t-shirt and jeans, probably uh-huh. not as. I got into these extra, extra large ones, especially here as it gets warm. It just seems yeah. more. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, do you have a profession? I work at the bookstore mornings, and then from there, I used to want to be an artist or a musician or a writer. I, uh, because of my spectrum brain, I have all this creativity that's very scattered. Yeah. And it gives me, the, I can go home, I can do any of those things, and I no longer have to feel that I have to sell it or show it to anybody, so long as I'm enjoying doing it. Yeah. And, and it's very liberating. That I mean, sounds like a nice place to be. I, yeah. I, some of it I post on the internet, but less and less because. <laughs> I mean, I think it's good to have an outlet. Mm-hmm. But I think it's good to have an outlet where you can do what you want. Yeah, that was the thing. I started doing art, and I did a couple. I do a certain style here, kind of like that. Oh yeah, that's cool. Cool. Yeah. And people would want me to be real. Oh, do one just like that. And, and it's with anything. You music started. It's just two people started and just jamming and it kept growing and growing and then people started gathering and then they'd start saying things like could you play that that but play it exactly the way <laughs> yeah. and that you get into that uh, fixed assemblage yeah. and it's really easy to do i mean once you become famous if you have a hit song oh you can ride that to play that for song 40 years and it, yeah it, it, it could it, me i'd go nuts yeah. Well, but I always wonder why they do it because you could also just well, sure, but and yeah, getting I guess, the I mean, gigs. Sure, that's I mean, the once answer, you but... start making money, then other people start relying on your roadies mm. and your other well, bandmates, that's point. and you you change the whole thing and you just pull the whole rug out from under that. I mean, it's happened with many bands. Yeah. I knew a guy. Larry Chance from Larry Chance and the Earls and he had one hit song Remember, Remember, Remember remember. You probably (laughs) heard it on an oldie and he's I asked him how could you do that song he said I do it every night and I don't I I hate that song (laughs) but it's made me so I don't have to go dig a ditch yeah totally but yeah, having to repeat, especially me and the way my brain works, it it drives me nuts. Yeah. Yeah. I get tired of a song before I even learn it all the way. That's happened yeah. too. <laughs> well, you work at the bookstore. I need a book. Maybe you can recommend one. Uh, what do you like? I love Gunter Grass. Are you familiar? I love. Um, I need no. I need. I haven't been reading. I have ADHD, uh-huh. and for the last three or four years, I've been working my butt off. And I was doing construction work, and I have not been reading. The last book I really enjoyed was Tin Drum by Gunter Grass, and the last book I really enjoyed before that was um, The Brothers Karamazov, and those are both really big, heady books. I it have took a, me a really easy long time to read them. book. Okay. There is a philosopher from Portugal. His name was Pessoa. And he wrote a book called The Book of Disquiet. And it's these short little bits. And it's almost like some of them, a different person wrote them. And he's approaching the same idea from a completely different point of view. Whoa. And it's just, it's one of my favorites. At the, Friends from Europe turned me on to him, and they brought me his biography. He didn't like people and was very, very rarely associated with people. 
and he would take on this point of view and write books in that point. And he left this trunk. He was like almost not published in his life. And his friends knew he wrote, and they did some important people. And when he passed, they opened up this chest, and all this stuff was in it. And they're still going through it. They're almost Whoa. at the bottom. But yeah, he was just an amazing character, Pessoa. Interested. Portuguese. Yeah. So I wish I had some at the store, but you should be. He's fairly common these days. Okay. Great, perfect. And yep, thanks for asking me questions. That was kind of I, I like that. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, I just started asking my dad questions. You know, we like it's just really freaking weird to try and like learn about the world that we live in when it's completely different every generation. You know, like before the Industrial Revolution, uh, people just lived the same way generation after generation for like thousands of years. But we perceive it as that. But I would, I bet every set of parents looked at the kids had to rebel. (laughs) I mean, Duke Ellington's music was considered the most horrible racket by the... There's, the kids always have to do something. I think it's in us, and that's how we progress. Yeah. It may have been less extreme mm-hmm. in other times, but I suspect. Yeah. It's a very human thing, I think. Mm. So you don't believe that the teenager was invented in the 1950s? It was commodified mm. in the 40s, even, with, like, Frank Sinatra. And you go back... Oh yeah, that's John Philip like Sousa and that teenagers. marching music. <laughs> yeah. He would he had more illegitimate children. He did, the band traveled all over and it's there the, were the piccolo solos just get me then. hot. Yeah. <laughs> the, and, and the trousers, the, the the uniform that they would wear was very um, erotic for its time. You had the tango and going back I think there was always something that was a little taboo. Mm-hmm. Well, at, at any rate, I just I think it's important for people to talk. It occurs to me that there are people when my dad was my age, there are still people alive who were involved in the Civil War, the American Civil War. Yeah. You know, and now Gen Z is just starting to get to a place where I think we can recognize that they're not completely hopeless. <laughs> that they're, <laughs> they're like doing some really great stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's no. just a little bit confusing to me, a millennial who's never felt old before. Yeah. Oh, you just wait. <laughs> you just wait. Oh, what I what I was able to do as a kid. First thing in the morning, your parents would throw you get out of the house, come back when it gets dark. Now, if you do that, that's child abuse. <laughs> Some people just never work till they're 22, are always, and they don't socialize, and they're just dumped on the world. And it's interesting to see how they're adapting, because I thought they would be helpless. And, but no, everybody figures it out. They're just doing it from a completely different perspective. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it's, like you say, you got to stay open and not dismissive, because. I've been through that, and it's a bad place to be. You gotta always be try to be as open as you can, yeah. even if it seems. Because yeah, I'm, I, I've, be, I've reached that age now where like the music and K-pop and like I turn on the radio. Like, What's that racket? <laughs> oh. Right, you have to like quiet down all the that, angry old man in your head. All that banging, <laughs> what's that banging? It get all sounds lawn, the same. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Get off my lawn. <laughs> Senior agitation. Yeah. I've already got that going, so Yeah, well <laughs> cultivate it, Need to cut it embrace in. it yeah. and then let it dissipate. Mm. But that you recognize it. I I wasn't recognizing it at a certain point. And, I had to have it pointed out. <laughs> exactly. You young people <laughs> running around playing your folky music. <laughs> you see Ingo was in there. Was, 
Uh, oh, well, his <laughs> face is totally transformed. Oh, yeah, no, the, uh, he, he loves... Like electric dance music from say the '90s and early 2000s oh, yeah. is his thing, oh, and when sure. this was that when he was doing those parties, it was just awesome. It was like stepping into a time machine. Yeah, cool. That looked awesome in there. Oh yeah, and all his lights. And, yeah. yeah. I'm glad that wasn't happening while you were playing, though. I would have been. Oh yeah, I'd easily distracted. To dance. Yeah. Shall yeah. Shall we? Uh, See, see what Ingo's yeah. up to oh, and pack yeah. up. It was, thank you so much. Remind me your name. I'm sorry, I did Brett. at the very end. Brett. Brett. Yeah. Nice. Um, is your bookstore open on Saturday? I, I'm there every morning of the world till at least 10. And there you have it. Um, an interview and uh, an interesting conversation, and the tables kind of turned on me, which that was neat. Um, and uh, I appreciated it. And the appreciator will continue. Uh, to just keep listening and I appreciate your listening and any comments you may have uh, you can send them to kpqr.torc at gmail.com I'll repeat that kpqr.torc at gmail.com and uh, as I like to say at the end of these things, uh, let's all get together and set the controls for the heart of the fun. <laughs>